different countries in different circumstances, each facing similar but sometimes very different constraints. And we are asking our resident coordinators and the UN country teams out there to have an answer to everything. And I think that might be asking perhaps a little bit much. But I think the, the initiative around PAGE and, and some of the work that we're doing together with DCO and with the, with the resident coordinator teams um, are designed to give you a sense of, of what might be options that you could propose, what kinds of changes could be made to the way policy is made, and how can we actually ensure that we are aligning ourselves with the SDGs and really building back or building forward better. Because as I said, everywhere, we're all turning towards this uh, thinking about what, what should the recovery look like. And in many developing countries, the options are going to be severely limited. We have restricted fiscal space, which we have dealt with for a long time. It's even more restricted than it was before. We have rising and in some cases, crisis level debt to deal with. And we've had a disruption of global trade um, over the past three years, and in particular since the outbreak of the crisis, which is really changing the way in which um, countries can envisage to use trade as an engine of their growth. It may be an entirely different prospect going forward than it has been over the past few decades. Trying to craft a recovery in those sorts of constrained circumstances is going to require a, a, a careful reprioritization of expenditures, and even more important, it's going to require a careful integration of policies. Mm -hmm. Why do I say expenditures? Well, yes, of course, we all have to strengthen revenues from the richest to the poorest, but that's not always easily done, and it certainly is not always quickly done. Yes, developing countries need international support, but the international support isn't going to cover everything that's needed, and it, in any case, cannot be guaranteed, and it may not be in time. And so that, for, for those two reasons alone, I think that a, a major part of the way in which countries start to prepare for these recovery plans will be a very careful attention to getting the expenditures quite right. Now, all of this kind of reflection is going to be happening in a very challenging context. For the countries, for the developing countries in particular, the challenge is going to be how do we avoid being sort of forced or obliged to move to austerity prematurely. And this has happened many, many times in the past, most recently after the last global crisis. As soon as there's a sign of stability, um, powers that be start to require that um, fiscal situations be consolidated in order to manage the debt. The net effect of that is to choke off or stagnate the recovery. And we've seen that happen the last time around. That is not what we want if we really want to have a, a vital recovery and something that's vibrant enough to put us back on the track to the SDGs. The second challenge would be for you who are representing the UN out in the field, in the countries, the resident coordinator offices in the UN country teams. Because as important it is, is, as it is for the countries to avoid austerity, it'll be equally important for you, the UN representatives, to be able to offer alternatives to that austerity, to the standard policy response that is going to be uh, put front and center um, more and more as time passes by. And I think that to do this, there are two things that have to happen. One, we have to make the economic case for the SDGs. We have to show that it makes economic sense to pursue the investments, to pursue the expenditures that are clearly linked and aligned with the SDGs. And that as these expenditures take place, these investments take place, we create the foundation for the kind of robust growth, and that growth has to be of a certain quality, that can enable the countries then to consolidate their fiscal circumstances in a more graduated and managed manner, and to set the stage then for the kind of inclusive and low carbon and resilient growth that we're going to need in order for the SDGs to occur. And that means that the economic arguments have to focus on the sustainable investments that are needed. They have to focus on the low carbon and the climate action um, policies that will have to be part of the recovery policy framework. They will have to focus on protecting biodiversity and showing that this is not a cost to the economy, but it is an investment in the future of the economy. But we also have to make the case for inclusive growth that helps to combat in inequality from the outset, for social protection that helps to build up the resilience. And in many respects, what we're going to be arguing for is that some of the changes that were made during the economic the emergency response period 
we want to try to make them permanent changes because those were the right things to do at the time mm -hmm. and they're the right things to continue doing into the future. The second element of the response to this challenge is that we have to drive in each of the countries a discussion around what has to be done to get the private sector, both the domestic and the foreign private sector, involved in the recovery effort, but on the right terms. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So in this context, I would say, and I'm not going to be very long in these opening remarks because I really want to hear what you have to say, what your experience has been. I, I want to make three points. The first is that we have to strengthen SDG alignment. SDG alignment has been poor, and not just in developing countries. I was just telling um, the colleagues a little bit earlier that I was talking to a friend who works in a government in Europe and says that when you speak to them about the SDGs, there's a great degree of lack of awareness, if you will, and certainly uh, the policies in that country are not being deliberately aligned with the SDGs. The reason we were off track before the crisis is because our policies had not changed sufficiently, were not aligned with the SDGs. Strengthening that SDG alignment will allow the economic benefits from the sustainability agenda to become stronger and to take hold. And so our challenge, uh, responsibility here is to make the case that doing so Strengthening this alignment is the absolute priority as the recovery plans are formulated, even if it means delaying the fiscal consolidation by a couple of years. And there are aspects of this. You have to make, make sure in the policy discussion that the policies themselves are consistent with the SDGs. It cannot be accepted that any country out there is still prior um, um, subsidizing fossil fuels, for example. But in making the policies consistent, we want to be looking at the spillovers and the co-benefits that policy making in one area changes, innovations in one area may also generate benefits elsewhere. And in an era of resource shortfalls, that's critically important. We, we have to concentrate the efforts where the bang for the buck is the biggest. That's where the prioritization becomes critically important. We have to look for the areas of expenditure in the policy innovations that can make the biggest difference. So we know that sustainable infrastructure is going to be necessary to enable sustainable private activity. But we also know that there has to be the right enabling environment in place to encourage sustainable private investment. You can build on the rising interest in environmental, social and governance factors in investing, the rising private sector interest in sustainability overall. You don't have to convince the private sector that sustainability is good, but we do have to convince the private sector that it is good enough, good enough to be considered on equal footing with non-sustainable activity, in which case making the shift becomes somewhat easier. And third, and this is something I alluded to earlier, we have to try and make sure that the most important and critical parts of the emergency response measures can be retained for as long as possible and wherever necessary. So for example, uh, emergency um, social protection and enterprise support were critical parts of the response to the crisis. That aspect of policy needs to be maintained and, and fostered for as long as is possible, because it is so critical to the recovery. Second element is innovation on finance. And I'm going to say this here, the first and most important innovation has to be in mindsets. We have to finally understand that official financing is important. It will remain important, but we cannot afford to get hung up on it because it will not be enough. No matter how much people agree that there should be more international support, more ODA, it will never be enough to finance the SDGs. Everyone knows that we need to just get over that fixation on the ODA and start to examine what is needed to strengthen our own domestic revenue basis in the countries, but to get the private investment flowing. That means finding out where the private investment should go, either alone or in partnership with the government, and where it shouldn't go at all. That means looking at the different types of instruments of private money, finding out what is out there, and getting help if necessary in choosing the right mix. The integrated national financing framework is designed to do precisely that. And one has to be clear about what needs to be in place in order for the private money to move. There has to be that pipeline of bankable projects and it has to be at scale. And that means we have to think about aggregation where necessary, perhaps across different municipal jurisdictions, perhaps for some investment types or across borders even for some of the big investment projects. And we have to make sure we have the right policies, clearly aligned with the SDGs, consistent, predictable and clear, because that helps to manage the perceived risk that investors suffer from. And then the final uh, element is to take advantage of the opportunities that are offered by this crisis to move ahead and do things differently. 
And that means ensuring that the growth, when it resumes, is inclusive, low carbon, as I said, resilient, as I said, and green. So we're looking to see growth patterns that are inclusive, which will reduce the widening of inequality. We look to see that all investment decisions are checked for their consistency with the SDGs. We need to make sure that the recovery itself is a green recovery. The, the green industrialization is a concept that UNIDO has been working on for some time. They know what to do to avoid going down the same path, making the same mistakes as the advanced countries made. We know that there is a huge potential for green jobs, and jobs are perhaps the biggest challenge that countries will face in the recovery. And we know that there's a tremendous potential to make financial systems themselves more sustainable, to mobilize green finance at serious scale in order to fund all of these activities. And so to just draw to a conclusion now, I think I'd like to highlight that that is where I see the real value of PAGE. Because PAGE for quite some time now, seven years they've said, has been gathering experiences from different countries in different contexts, at different scales, at different levels of development, to develop a sense of what works, how it can be done, concrete policy suggestions based on deep and thoroughly prepared country-specific analysis to foster and promote and enable a green recovery. And so you can draw from the experiences that other countries have had within the PAGE program, and I encourage all of you to the extent possible, and Stephen and Asa, they may not like this idea, but look seriously at how PAGE can be uh, a help for your country if PAGE has not already been engaged in your countries. Because I think that this is one of the areas where the UN has been on the money and has been ahead of the curve. And it is the address to which countries should turn. There are a few of those, and many of them in recent times. It's the social uh, protection is one of them. The sustainable development agenda overall is another. The focus on equitable development is a third. And the whole concept of the green economy is a fourth. And this is the one way I think that we can use this crisis to accelerate the transformation of our, of our countries to something that is going to be resilient and sustainable over time and allow us to build back better and at the same time uh, meet the requirements of leaving no one behind. Let us please all of us take advantage of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elliot, for those words and for painting the, the broad tableau of the picture that, that faces us. Uh, so many challenges, so many of them intertwined. And of course, coming back to, uh, yes, and I'm seeing some virtual applause happening as well out there, which is, which is great. Um, and Elliot, you've set the stage very well for um, what comes next is a discussion, but also um, a few slides from the PAGE team, uh, which Asad has asked me to run through. Definitely not a, a one-person show, but I will throw them up on the screen here for colleagues, and I will invite um, Smita, Marek, and a few others to um, pitch in if they want. Again, this is not a monologue. This is simply setting the stage. So what is this um, PAGE effort? And hopefully most of you who are in countries uh, where PAGE is operating have already begun to see the value of PAGE to the work that you're doing because PAGE is essentially about reframing economic policies to drive sustainability. Um, and as country economists, we really depend on you to help set the context in which that can happen. We depend on you to advise and orient the PAGE work plans, which as Assad said, are over four years and run into substantial uh, resources like a half a million or a quarter of a million every year, depending on where the country is. So really this effort is about practical on the ground support to countries. So here are the slides. Um, and if Gavin, if you have them just to run through them quickly, um, the whole question of value in the economy, this is a quote from um, Mazukatu, who many of you know, but when are we creating value? When are we detracting value? When are we creating uh, assets? When are we creating liabilities with our economy? And this sits at the core of the green economy thinking, which Elliot described earlier. Next slide, please. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Megatrends Report, which Elliot, you authored with all of the economists in the UN, I believe, which looks at the megatrends. But certainly, how can you think about economic growth and prosperity when you have things like nature loss, climate change, gaping inequalities, pollution and toxic toxicity, which began to uh, detract from human health and actually create massive downturns in productivity and, and social equality. Next slide, please. 
There's no doubt that the pandemic and the ensuing lockdown has hit countries really hard. Almost all countries very hard, but even within countries, huge differences in how it's played out between different households, between different income groups, between ur urban and rural groups. And again, here, we really want to hear from you how it is affecting your countries. There's a big rebound, which is projected for 2021. I personally question whether that's not optimistic, whether we're actually going to have that V or that W, whatever the, the curve might look like. Um, it would be interesting to hear from you as well. Certainly the hits to um, employment, to unemployment, to income loss, to trade loss uh, has been massive. Next slide, please. So going forward, this is the question for us. How can PAGE make a difference? How can PAGE working with you and you working with PAGE make a difference? Next slide, please. So there's a couple of areas where we've thought in our initial thinking that we want to share with you. And these are really modalities, engaging with national and regional think tanks, the cutting edge thinkers who you interact with, that the central banks interact with, the ministries of finance interact with, international think tanks like Oxford, Cambridge, um, others. And of course, working with UN expertise across the UN. And again, today it speaks volumes, Elliot, that you're here in the role as the UN chief economist, leading the first cadre of UN economists on the ground. To me, this is such an exciting moment um, and talking about green recovery. And of course, the analytical tools that we've been developing over time. And when I say we, I mean, not only UNEP, of course, but UNDP, UNITAR, UNIDO, uh, ILO, and many other colleagues across the UN. Next slide, please. So on the content, and again, this is just some ideas to get the conversation going. What are those policies that will have the biggest impact in terms of making the recovery greener and more inclusive in your countries? Which are those policies in your view? Are they the industrial policies? Are they green financing, green, green finance roadmaps, employment policies, national economic planning? Which are the ones at this point in time that can be of the biggest benefit? What are your countries asking for? Is it about managing debt loads, shrinking fiscal space, managing reserves? These are all questions that uh, Elliot has put on the table. We'd like to hear from you. Now, this is the last slide in the slide deck. And um, here's just an example of some work that Paige and its partners have been doing over time. On the right-hand side, some scenarios work with Cambridge Econometrics. These are scenarios from South Africa, looking at South Africa's possible recovery pathways. Um, and it's measured in terms of growth, income, also um, carbon profiles, employment profiles over time. And then on the left-hand side of the screen is work we're doing with Oxford Smith, which looks at spending, uh, recovery spending over time, rescue and recovery spending over time, the $15 trillion of assets that have been announced, in what sectors are they playing out? And we're tracking this for the top 50 economies plus all of the page countries. It's a very rich data set, over 3,500 observations, totaling those $15 trillion worth of um, spending announcements. So this is the slide deck. I have a bunch of colleagues from the PAGE team who have helped to prepare these slides, including Marek from the ILO, Smita from UNIDO, uh, Babatunde from UNDP, Kamal and others from the PAGE team. But Smita and Marek, what I'd like to do here is first throw the door open to our colleagues on the ground that they can tell us their priorities and then invite you to come in and comment on what we could offer from the PAGE side. So colleagues, I'm going to open it up. There is a chat box which is open. There is a raise the hand function. And um, why don't, just as we kick it off, the first one who wants to dive in can dive in. And meanwhile, since Mita, I'm seeing you on the, on the screen there, anything you would like to add to what I've just, to what I've just put forward? Um, uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, um, Elliot. I think um, both of you have put the case across extremely well. Um, how we spend uh, the recovery funds and how we invest it will determine how well we do in the future. So uh, it is a very exceptional and unique um, opportunity that we have here and um, yes I would just like to hear from from the uh, 
colleagues in the field to see what it is that they're being asked for and uh, how we can help. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. Marek, since I see you there as well, and, and the questions are starting to pile in, which is good, but Marek, anything you want to add before, um, before we jump into the real give and take? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, I think, Elliot, you put it very well in the beginning <clears throat> to make the economic case for uh, the SDGs, and I think that is uh, what this is all about. Um, if you look, uh, for example, the, the work we're currently doing with the Ministry of Finance in South Africa, it's precisely to provide the evidence base of certain policies. So we compare a conventional recovery with a green uh, or green push scenario, um, unpacking the Ramaphosa plan. And we do show, in fact, that um, the green recovery is superior in terms of uh, GDP growth as well as um, employment um, uh, creation. And now at the same time, it's not all rosy. And this is why uh, we believe it's so important to um, base um, policy advice on economic models uh, that tell uh, the truth, because obviously there will be some job losses, uh, notably South Africa heavily relying on coal. We need a just transition. Uh, otherwise, um, we'll be blocked by uh, the social movements, uh, by the unions, and we need to ensure that uh, no one is left behind. And, and that is why it's so important to point numbers to those who may lose their jobs and enact at the same time as we enact stimulus packages to enact social protection policies, uh, skills retraining policies, so as to enable a just transition uh, so that um, there's no opposition to it, as well as we can reap the benefits of um, the double dividend in terms of uh, environmental protection, as well as employment creation. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Marek. So in case you couldn't guess, Marek from the ILO, and Smita from UNIDO, and we'll hear other colleagues from the PAGE partnership as well. So I'm understanding, uh, Fulvia, you, you have the first question, over to you, or you have the floor, rather. Yeah, more than a question, um, reflecting on the opportunities for greening the economy in, in Argentina, which is the, car, the country I have the privilege to serve. Um, Argentina is a, is a middle-income country with uh, a significant industrial capacity and there is a huge potential, in my view, to, to link the pand post-pandemic recovery uh, with, green, uh, with the green economy agenda. The industry is, uh, is, is highly energy inefficient. Mm -hmm. Transportation is carried out mainly by land uh, and the agro-industrial sector, as we all know, Please, such an important role in fiscal stabilization, but the bioeconomy is still quite uh, at infant stage. So there is much to do towards the development of non-conventional renewable energies, natural-based solutions, aquaculture, agroforestry, electromobility, sustainable cities, circular economy. Um, and that's where the UN system as a whole, and PAGE in particular, uh, has an important role to play and is playing an important role. Uh, the UN system is also uh, has to play an important role in supporting the National Climate Change Cabinet, um, which which plans the compliance with the uh, NDCs. And I would just like to remind that that in the commitment announced uh, last year during the Climate Ambitions Summit, the President of Argentina Fernandez um, announced the adoption of climate change as a state policy and committed to uh, more ambitious NDCs plus 26% and, and uh, a low emission development strategy with the goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Now mm. the issue is how do we support the government in transforming commitments into real action? Um, I would like to raise here issues that, that look secondary, at least in the policy debate in the country, but I think they are not, mm -hmm. especially if we want to remain ahead of the curve, as, uh, as Chief Economist Elliot was saying. Um, I, I feel here that we're really looking uh, too much uh, in, only at the national productive dimension. And, and I think we should think about the future of the country within the framework of the new um, economic geography that the, the crisis has brought about and, for example, start imagining the potential of regional value chains 
um, the, the, the disruptive events, not only the pandemic crisis, but mostly, but also the commercial and trade uh, wars and so on, has mm. brought um, changes in the productive geography and, and have changed the rules of the game. We can imagine that proximity and security factors will play a larger role in the near future, so uh, and that relocation opportunity will emerge. And so we might be called to think about how to strengthen regional production systems, for example, in renewable energy. There are plenty of mm, new technological solutions already available um, with smaller environmental footprint, mm, generating employment and produced uh, eventually, regionally. Uh, uh, and despite its financial instability, uh, and desp despite the fact that this debate is not present at the moment, uh, Argentina is one of the countries uh, with, with the best conditions to develop clean energy generation projects. And, and that's where some dynamic and job-creating FDI could be attracted with, with proper strategies and, and policy action. And finally, finally, I would like to raise the issue of the need to reform the, the global financial system um, in order to assist uh, a, a highly indebted, uh, mm -hmm. overwhelmed by the debt burden, uh, middle income countries such as Argentina, which needs anyway to regain a certain degree of flexibility in decision making at the policy level and, and hopefully access new international financial resources, which now looks like a dream. Um, so I would like here to, to ask the support of Paige uh, to develop, uh, to also give me guidance uh, beyond maybe a pilot project but uh, around the topic of debt to bring recovery swap that would be adapted to, this, to the situation of Argentina, which otherwise would be always mm, be left a bit aside from by current discussions uh, on like the G21 related to debt and that mostly concern uh, LDCs. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Fluia. It's a wonderful um, menu of topics that you've shared with us today. And I'm sure the last one, um, Elliot mentioned the consolidation of the fiscal space. So I'm sure we'll come back to that one as well in terms of how we manage um, manage uh, debt burdens. So I have um, a list of, um, of economists who want to come in. So Nurjamal from Mongolia and then Ricardo from South Africa. Nurjamal, I'm probably pronouncing your name wrong, but over to you. Yes, uh, you are pronouncing correctly. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so it's 930 here in Mongolia. <laughs> so glad. Uh, good, 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 good morning. Good, good, good afternoon and good evening to me. So um, I just want to say that um, uh, in Mongolia, yeah, there is a high reliance um, on, on coal and coal is um, as you probably know, uh, coal is like a 90% of export is is actually min mineral resources, and um, almost all, all of them goes to China. So this actually, and, and the, the COVID pandemic actually uh, showed the, the the vulnerability of of of, of the of the country's economy um, to to such a dependence and also mm -hmm. volatility of of commodity prices as well. So um, and and uh, because of that, the, the actually in the first half of the of of 2020, uh, economy contracted significantly, almost by 10 percent. And uh, and uh, in in early in August, when China and Mongolia agreed to establish this um, um, green gateway, so they were uh, able to rebound the export of of coal. And this actually helped to rebound the the the, the, the economic growth as well in, in in two quarters of 2020. So um, now we have like uh, based on preliminary results, its uh, current contraction is minus 5.3 percent. But what this uh, what lessons learned um, uh, from the COVID pandemic we have is actually. Um, such dependence on coal, um, it, it's 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 not sustainable, right? And um, and um, and and all, and especially 
Um, given this global climate um, um, uh, action and China's commitment to reduce carbon emissions, mm. it actually may cause uh, an additional challenge uh, to, to economic outlook of Mongolia. Uh, unless uh, Mongolia will diversify its economy, it's, it's I mean, um, and, and will try to find a way. But what are the options and what are the alternatives to call um, in this country? This is a question that we are discussing with the uh, policymakers and currently we are supporting um, RCO um, uh, with the um, country team. We are supporting development of the 2022 annual program as mm. well as a 10 year, um, a se seven 10 year targeted pro uh, programs around different um, uh, topics. So, um, and um, and uh, that will be, so we will be doing uh, simulations of different policy options and, um, and, and, and definitely we'll be talking about um, green development and green recovery. Mm. Um, but when we look, um, so um, mainstreaming SDGs and green um, recovery and uh, green development in the national program in one of, is, one, uh, is, is one issue. But another issue which we have analyzed in our CCA, uh, we looked at the investment plan, five-year investment plan uh, for, um, from 2021 till 2025. And what we see that the country actually invests only 2% of total investment go to green development. So when, when the government and president made a commitment um, at the at the Climate and uh, Ambition Summit, um, so they, he actually announced that uh, uh, the, the new target, um, uh, NDC target, 2022.7 mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, emission reduction by 2030. And it's a big question for us uh, how uh, government plans to, to, um, uh, to achieve this goal without taking um, uh, drastic measures, right? So, um, and and this is why we actually um, decided and um, and 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 um, um, just it, it's it's a hard topic. It's very political issue in the country. But uh, without um, um, doing this, I, in my view, it's very difficult to talk about real green development in the country. Mm. So what we are planning to do is we, we want to start a dialogue uh, with the government on, um, on, 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 uh, on energy subsidy reform. So there is an indication already in the national, um, in, in the government plans that they are planning to align uh, the energy tariffs with the market principle. What does it mean? Oh, well, it's, 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 they still like, uh, would like to see and, um, um, and 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 to see the analysis and the evidence what will be a social and economic implications of this energy subsidy reform. So this is something that we are planning to do with um, with UNEP and UNIDA, and um, I think also um, and UNEP will be focusing on on energy subsidy analysis. Um, and, and what UNIDA will be doing is very is also very important to promote renewable energies because the country has a huge potential for uh, renewable energy, which is underutilized. So it's uh, like uh, around 26 sunny days during the year, windy steps and all those. So it's a huge potential for wind and solar energy. But unfortunately, this uh, is, is, is not utilized and there is still a heavy reliance on mining. So, so yeah, uh, let me stop about, here. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if there are any questions, I, um, I will be happy to answer. Okay, no, thank you. It's fascinating. Um, the more you speak, the more fascinating it is. But I'm conscious that other colleagues also have very fascinating stories to tell. And Ricardo, I'm going to come to you next from South Africa, and then we'll go back to you, Elliot. I see you raised your hand. We have a couple more questions, but let's go like that, Ricardo, and then Elliot. Hello, can you see me? Hello. Yeah. See you and hear you. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invite for this great session. Uh, yeah. So I've been asked to talk very briefly about opportunities for green in the economic recovery in page countries. So what I'm going to say now is 
quite general. It's not so much focused on South Africa, the country where I'm in now. Uh, I see both opportunities and challenges that come with greening economic recovery in page countries. Now, let me just talk a little bit about opportunities. One thing it may be quite obvious, but let's say that. Let's uh, uh, reiterate that point that I see going green in a recovery effort. That's good, not just for the environment, but also for recovery itself. And I say that because going green means going for more investment. So in other words, going for an investment boost. We could have recovery based on on uh, recurrent expenditure, on consumption, but going green means going uh, through an investment boost. So that's very important. Going green means not just more investment, it opens new areas of investment. So that's also very important. And new areas of investment does what? It fosters innovation, innovation in green technologies, etc., cetera, uh, which uh, will be a further boost to growth and so on. So all that is very important. So what I see is an opportunity uh, to go for a new cycle of innovation and growth. Now let's be clear, greening the economy implies more, not less growth. So what we have is a great opportunity for doing things, what, differently, for doing better, for doing better, for sustainability, for inclusiveness, and doing better for the well-being for everybody. Uh, now, what about the challenges? The challenges is that, as in any uh, transition, there will be losers. And, and as Marek has pointed out, workers of old industries will be losers. Uh, those businesses and investors linked to stranded assets will be losers. So naturally, all that causes resistance, resistance to change. And we have to be able to deal with it. We cannot just ignore that because otherwise we don't have this uh, transition to a green economy. Uh, on workers losing their jobs, uh, one interesting thing is that, uh, and, and Stephen has shown some slide, slides about that, is that Page uh, has run a macroeconometric modeling uh, for South Africa. And that exercise suggests that a green push will be a net job create, creator. So that's very important. And that's the case even for South Africa, even for South Africa, which is an economy which is very much coal, a coal-based economy. Coal is the basis of the uh, energy matrix of the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, green push in other page countries will be even more so positive uh, because there are not perhaps so, uh, uh, the energy matrix is not so much based on fossil fuels, as is the case for South Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, the other yeah. challenge is how to finance a green recovery. And, and Elliot talked a little bit about that. We don't have resources. We cannot count on ODA. Uh, we have to look for private resources for that purpose. Now, in my view, the answer to that is really to draw on those financial institutions that are there, are modeled, they are designed, they are equipped to do that kind of job, to, to finance uh, green investment. And for me, these are development banks. So uh, the answer uh, to that is to enhance these institutions, to inject more capital in them so that they can leverage resources from the capital markets, that means leveraging private resources for financing green technologies, green investment for recovery. So that's a key point for me, it's how to finance green recovery, because as I said at the beginning, it's very much about investment, investment base. And for that, we need all the right mechanisms to be able to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, you've touched on a very important point, which is liquidity. For those countries that have central bank and, and printing power, no problem. But for those countries that have to go to external markets or issue bonds, um, liquidity might be a bigger issue. And then who do you turn to, the internal markets or to the development banks? Very, very good point. So Elliot, we've heard from three um, country economists at this point. There are three more waiting, but let's let's come back to you for a moment to, to reflect on what you've heard so far. 
Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I wanted to react on on two things, and um, Ricardo's last point also sort of stirs my argumentative juices. But um, uh, fully, I said something that was really, really important. Uh, trade has changed. Mm -hmm. The di disruption means that issues that perhaps were less important before are going to be more important. Our proximity and security were two that you mentioned, Fulvia. You couldn't be more right. And you spoke as well about strengthening regional production chains and situating countries within these new supply chains. I think that's really important because it's a process that's underway already. However, I'd like to expand that thinking in another direction. Many of our countries, our developing countries, are relatively small markets. And when we talk about the kinds of investments that we need for sustainable development to attract the private sector, many of those investments are going to be in sustainable infrastructure. And much of the, as Ricardo said, as we talk about boosting investment and much of the investment which can drive recovery can in fact be innovative investment, bringing in new technologies. That means it has to be in a, um, tech, in a investment that is either supported by or completely driven by the private sector. And that's where I think we have an option to think very innovatively about the fundamental problem of aggregation. I spent the last five years, including while I was still with UNEP, talking to the private financial sector across the world. And there were three questions that they always raised. It's the question of, is there a pipeline of bankable projects? How do we assess the risk? And what about the scale? They cannot, will not, should not come out and try to invest in micro projects. It is not possible to invest two and a half trillion dollars a year in SDGs, $100,000 at a time. No one can do it. So we have to find some way to make the investment projects large enough to attract mm -hmm. capital. That means aggregation. It could mean that in a given country, if we're doing investment in renewable energy, that we bring together the renewable in, in energy investments in all kinds of different municipal settings so that we have a renewable energy investment program at the national level, which might be sizable enough to attract the investment. But we can also think about whether we can aggregate across national boundaries. And that would mean that we have to have the international community involved, because once we cross national boundaries, it's different policies, different jurisdictions, different responsibilities, and the international community, particularly the UN, will have to play the role of the, I won't say guarantor, but at least the facilitator of coherent policy that is consistent over time. Second question is on the finance. Um, yes, definitely, uh, the national development banks can play a large role in leveraging private finance, but let us not forget that that will very often translate into some form of blended finance transaction, some form of public money on the balance sheet of the national development banks taking over the risk that the private sector otherwise would have to face. That may be necessary, that may be fine, but it's a very uh, problematic issue because there's only so much uh, that you can do without then starting to subsidize the risk, subsidize the profit of the private sector. And we've been doing that, colleagues, for 50 years. That's what national and international development banks have always done. Right? There has to be a point in time where, for example, domestic financial systems step up to the plate and start to take it on. And we have in many countries very underdeveloped or less than sophisticated financial markets, but every country has banks. And whether those banks are sufficiently engaged in providing support to the private entrepreneurs in that country, that is a question all of us would have to answer with no. Banks earn very nice returns by doing what they've always done. None of them are willing to invest. None of them, well, okay, I'm being a little bit exaggerated, but if the banks are there doing that role, sort of facilitating the transition to equity finance for, for companies, small companies, companies that they know because they are their clients, that makes it much, much easier for a country, for a government, to start thinking about attracting capital from somewhere else including from the domestic, private, non-financial sector, because there is financial surplus everywhere in the world. Some of it just doesn't stay where it's supposed to stay. And so that is the third thing uh, that I, I want to talk about a little bit is when we talk about financing the green recovery, we also have to be talking about developing the financial system, because right now we're in a situation where the financial system is not carrying its weight in a country, far too much of the responsibility for sustainable development falls onto the government. 
and they have to carry far too much of that load. And so I think we need to really seriously explore the possibilities of strengthening the domestic financial system so it can step up and play a role in financing at least a part of the sustainable development effort that needs to happen. And I don't think we spend enough time thinking about that in the UN. It's something I wish we could change. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Elliot. I'm, I'm tempted to think of the uh, work of the inquiry on the green finance roadmaps that you were a part of earlier and that I believe with UNDP this work goes forward and certainly an area that Paige could get more involved with in terms of stimulating uh, domestic financial resources. Um, we have three other colleagues on the line who would like to share and I just want to take a time check here. We were originally scheduled to stop at the top of the hour. Elliot, can you and colleagues go another 15 minutes or do you need to drop off 15. Okay, wonderful. Then we'll, colleagues, um, then I have Luz from Peru and then uh, Manop from Thailand next. Luz, over to you. So, Sorry, uh, if, if I could just interject, I see Ami Gay has, has had her hand up or his hand yep. up for quite some time. I don't know. Yep, I have, I have her as okay. well after Manop. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Luz? Are you still with us, Luz? Okay, if not, then let's go to Manop from... Hi, everyone. My name is Manop, economist in UNS or Thailand. I'd like to spend around two minutes to talk about the uh, Thailand fiscal stimulus packages to combat COVID-19 and to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. So COVID-19 is an unprecedented global health crisis, which is having major economic and social impacts in Thailand. Since the pick up in severity of the virus pandemic, the Ministry of Finance has responded quickly to the virus outbreak by announcing five fiscal stimulus packages worth around 17% of GDP consisting mm -hmm. of various measures for both household and businesses to tackle the negative impact brought about by the virus. Um, the breakdown of the fiscal stimulus package shows that Thailand's career focused on helping vulnerable people while maintaining the health of the Thai economy through supporting businesses and creating jobs. The fiscal stimulus will help counter overall unemployment in Thailand to an extent through its focus on supporting SMEs, especially in tourism and its related businesses, such as hospitality, trade, and transport. Um, social, social protection measures, including unemployment benefits and cash handouts for informal workers, are decided to help vulnerable people cope with adversity and secure lives, livelihoods, and the economy. Um, Actually, however, one aspect that Thailand should consider including within the future policy is the planet. The performance and the resilience of the Thai economy depend on the health of the natural environment and ecosystems. To be back better, Thailand should not return to business as usual practice that put pressure on wildlife and biodiversity. Thailand should harness low carbon investment opportunities to reboot the economy while reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution, which jeopardize lives. It means pulling people out of poverty, creating more jobs, and reducing economic disparities. It will also help reduce the probability of future pandemics and broader environmental and climate change leaks as well. That's all over. Thank you very much, Manop. It's, it's staggering. 17% of GDP in the stimulus package. That is quite a, a wallop. Um, and it's good to hear that it's directed towards SME and tourism, which I'm sure were, were very hard hit. I understand that Thailand has a very active page uh, program as well. So I, I hope you're able to connect with them and make that more impactful. So I'm, Amy, over to you. Thank you for being patient. Hello, hi everyone. Um, I'm the economist in Senegal here and I just wanted to share a couple of insights and just contribute to the discussion. 
Um, in terms of building back better, I think it's very important that it is um, gender inclusive in general. I mean, I say that because in Senegal, for instance, it's been growing at the rate of uh, an average rate of 6% over the past five years because of a very comprehensive um, development plan. Unfortunately, COVID has put a halt to that and there's a risk of recession um, last year. However, having said that, the country has a very strong entrepreneurial spirit, especially among women. So some of the challenges really is getting the right financing and also sufficient capacity development in order to nurture this entrepreneurial spirit. So I think there's somewhere or an area where Paige can come into. Um, I haven't joined the UN for too long. I literally joined in October. But from what I've seen in terms of the Paige program, it's definitely something that we're trying to push through to give women more opportunities in those green spaces. But I think there's an area where perhaps Paige can help with by offering more um, um, supporting more female-led projects, especially in the green area. Um, another thing that has emerged from this um, pandemic is the importance of digitization, particularly in Senegal and I guess most of Africa, where there's a huge unbanked population. A lot of trans, um, state cash transfers have been done by um, digitization and money transfer remittances as well. These are very important sources of um, income here in these type of countries, notably in Senegal. I think that's an area where um, the UN in general as well as PAGE can help support policy formulation to encourage the development of the sector, because I always say there's a crisis. If you look carefully, there's always a positive silver lining that can be used to build resilience going forward. So again, this is just something I wanted to highlight. In terms of finances, um, Senegal is a low middle income country, so there's certain concessional financing windows that's definitely closed for it. So it does face challenges in terms of getting more finance to nurture its development going forward. And that's the reason why it's trying to sort of encourage the private sector, domestic and international to participate in the economy. Um, so green finance is definitely one that they're interested in. They are looking at innovative sources of finance, but green is definitely one. In terms of renewable energy, notably, um, is a priority area for the government in terms of electricity generation. As it stands at the minute, 22% of total electricity production is being done by um, renewable energy sources, notably solar. So they are looking to encourage similar sources of finances regarding of the fact that they do have lots of um, hydrocarbon reserves which are coming on, on stream in 2023. So the idea is basically to go on a development path whereby they're not going to be reliant upon um, uh, on their natural resources, which is very positive. Um, and also because it is part of a monetary union, it can't really use monetary policy to stimulate the economy at a period where it really is working to sort of um, put the levers in and get the economy back on track. Um, just to go back to what you said, Stephen, um, earlier about those questionable um, growth rates, I think I'm sort of a bit um, of a pessimist when I say this, but um, most of it's really going to be down to base effects, right? Because 2020 was a year where growth was pretty much negative for most countries. So those numbers do look high, but most of it would be base effects. And also the removal of barriers um, which should stop people from trading and um, conducting natural, um, normal economic activity would really be the bulwark of all those um, high numbers that you see. So just a quick one, because um, I know the time is against us. Cheers for giving me the time. Thank Thanks so much, Amy. Yeah, I hope you're right, and I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but And you very well may be right. I saw somewhere that savings have been pent up, so there's this huge purchasing power that's waiting to be unleashed once people can move around. And so, invest, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I hope that you're right. And it's fascinating to hear more about um, Senegal and what's happening there. Um, so, Lorenza, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. And also, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm following up on a call that we had with Assad uh, a while ago. And uh, I would like to share a little bit, uh, not just a perspective from Serbia, but also make a little bit of um, a reflection on uh, middle income countries at an advanced stage of development like Serbia is. You have to put this into context because uh, the government here um, has provided a stimulus package of over 12% of GDP has managed uh, the economy uh, downfall to a very reasonable minus 1%, which set against, you know, um, double digits uh, in, in other uh, economies, sets it into a very resilient, uh, at least economically resilient uh, uh, pathway. 
20% of the people who have received a vaccine, and not only that, but even they are given a choice of which vaccine they wish to receive. Like, do they wish to receive the Sputnik, the Sinopharm, the Moderna, the Pfizer-BioNTech? And to make it, you know, sound um, like, on the other hand, you see the air that is um, the most polluted air in the entire continent of Europe here in Belgrade. So it's it's a very it's a very interesting country to to work with. It's evident that when there is a will, uh, the government finds a way. That um, where I'm willing to take this conversation is, let's not pretend that we're all in the same room together, and let's really uh, discuss a bit more the political economy. Because we cannot pretend that we're all wishing to move towards a low carbon economy, that we're all together in, in here and that our governments are fully supportive of this. And not only that, but I'm, I'm going to, to, to say something extremely controversial now, but I will say it, that not all of the agencies are even on board with us. Uh, like at, at, uh, at headquarters level, yes. Then at country level, you find still a lot of projects that are dubiously supporting a transition. And um, and there are projects that are extremely untransparent, so that you know we, we don't know exactly what goes on in these projects, and you will have to go each by each to to really find out what is the real um, carbon uh, footprint of projects that are actually implemented in country right now. So I'll be controversial, but you know, what support can you give us as the country economists, knowing that we're not coming in with any budgets, we're not coming in with any resources, unlike bilateral donors, because let alone the agencies, maybe in fact I'm being too harsh on them. Let's talk about the bilateral donors then. You know, are all the bilateral donors on on, on the same page? You know, we're we're talking about page. Right? You know, it's a misnomer, but still, you know, are they all on the same page with us? And I don't think so. So, you know, what I'm uh, what I really need to what I really need your support is making that case. So, using those sophisticated economic models that you have. And uh, and and being able to to crunch those numbers, to try and and make a persuasive case, because that's our only way forward here. We're we're only as powerful as that narrative that we'll be able to build, and that I sincerely hope that you will uh, you will help us build. I I doubt that we can summon the political will to become a page country. Uh, however, and even so, we really would benefit from your assistance in in, uh, in, in advocacy. So thank you very much, and uh, and again thanks to Assad for uh, for uh, conversations uh, online and uh, and on and uh, on email. Thank you, Lorenza. Thanks um, for for the provocative thoughts. And in a way, um, you're speaking to the philosophy of Page, which was always. It's not so much the size of the money that counts, it's the quality of the ideas that we bring forward. And that really is the spirit behind PAGE. And it's enabled PAGE to grow from a very modest operation to what it is today. It's still a modest operation by the size of the UN, but yet hopefully making an impact. And, um, <clears throat> and I very much hear your plea as well about, more than a plea, your point that, that not everyone sees recovery along the same lines that we do. So we need to make the case. Our analytics need to be very sharp if we're going to make that case to make countries think about this as an opportunity and not just a first, a first response, a first aid recovery. Um, so we have one other comment here from um, Giuliano, Giuliano, and then we'll try to wrap it up. Elliot, I'm going to come back to you for some sort of capping remarks, and then we'll try to close. Thinking about next steps forward as well. This has been a very rich conversation. There's obviously page conversations going on in 20 countries, um, but this to me has value in and of itself, thinking forward about how we re green recovery efforts, how we support you in advising countries on greening recovery efforts and how we take this forward. And just making a plug, I've dropped into the chat box, um, the launch next week with um, colleagues from Oxford, from IMF, from UNEP and from other places, UNDP as well, for launching the Global Recovery Observatory that I mentioned earlier. So Giuliani, Giuliano, over to you. Okay. 
Uh, thanks, Stephen, and uh, greetings from uh, Uruguay. So I'm Julian. I'm the UNITAR focal point for page countries in Latin America. And I try to be very brief, being aware of the time. I have a quick question for Elliot. Um, I specifically noted uh, your the, the need for innovation and mindset that you pointed out in your keynote. And here I was just wondering, based on your extensive experience, what are the sort of pitches or actions or strategies we as economists and, and development practitioners in page countries should pursue to achieve that click in, in the minds of the policymakers we collaborate with, collaborate with to achieve that click or to instill that confidence in the policymakers to take that leap of faith and leave business as usual approaches behind and embrace truly innovative, innovative um, policies. So is it is it that you necessarily have to have a very solid economic model up your sleeve, or is it rather about bringing in high-level authorities, say from uh, IMF or World Bank, which have a lot of political clout? Is it about sustaining multi-stakeholder multi dialogue with civil society, UN country teams, uh, private sector, for example? Is it about financial carrots and sticks? I'm just wondering what, what makes policymakers click according to, to the experience you have. So what would be the, the most effective um, instrument? Super. Thanks very much, uh, Giuliano. So, uh, Elliot, we're coming back to you in wrap-up mode here, concluding thoughts and a very um, um, good question from Giuliano. Thank you. Um, indeed, I, I do think that that is a very intriguing question. No, I do not think that rolling out massive econometric models with all kinds of calculations, graphs and charts is going to convince any policymaker because the reason policymakers don't innovate is fear. They're all desperately afraid that, the, afraid that the innovation won't work and that they'll be held accountable. And perhaps that is where we can foster the kind of dialogue with multiple stakeholders that show that there is interest in all of these different stakeholder groups in doing things differently, getting into a mindset, if you will, that allows for the kind of innovation we're going to need, not just in terms of the financing that we want to mobilize, but in terms of those technologies that Ricardo was talking about that we need to have in our investments, embodied through our investments, in order for us to have any hope of getting to a green economy. So people have to understand that, yes, the transition is going to be painful. There will be some sectors that suffer. There will be some jobs that are lost. But they have to understand also where the potential is for the gains. And they have to understand the kind of social dialogue we need to have so that people can buy into a transition that is going to be bumpy in some cases, will have losers, but over time will generate far more winners. And it's that over time bit that's always the problem for the policymaker. Because if you're seeing the benefit in five years, two years after the election, unless they win the next election, they can't they can't claim that benefit. They can't claim the, 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 the praise for that. And so we have to give them enough confidence to make the change now and show the, tra the trajectory towards the the aspirational outcome that we want. So we're not going to have always a quick win that we can trot out and say, okay, here, this is what has happened. But we have to show the way in which we're setting the stage for much greater improvement down the road, I think. And, and the dialogue with the stakeholders is key. I think that you would have to look long and hard now to find any private investor who doesn't understand that the future of coal is very short indeed. You're going to find all kinds of people who would say, OK, but I'm going to continue to make money on it until until the time comes. But we can we it is very um, not easy, but it's very possible for us to show the case that, yes, you may make money until the day you can't. And you don't know when that day is, but it's going to be within a very short period of time. You're going to be stuck sitting on a whole pile of useless assets. You won't be able to offload on anybody else. And that is just short sighted. Hmm? And you tell the politicians that they will know the electorate when the time comes who made the wrong decision back then. You, see? you won't be able to escape it forever. But you can change now and tell people what you're doing and tell your, your private sector partners what you're doing and encourage that shift. And people will buy into it because they see your future perspective. Right? So that is, I think, what we need to do, the mindset change that we need to help, uh, help it to happen. Um, and that, I think, comes back to Lorenzo's point on the political economy. You know, I think we very often underestimate how difficult it is for change to happen hmm? because it is a step into the unknown. But again, I think we, we have enough evidence 
from around the world, from countries in different stages of development, that green recoveries or green economy is completely possible. And I think we have also enough analysis that gets us to, to make the case very convincingly that the investments that we need now, they pale in comparison to the costs we'd have to absorb later if we don't make the transition now, you see? And that's always, uh, my mother used to talk about a stitch in time saves nine, an old English saying. It simply means that if you prepare now, it will cost you less later. And we've, we've proved that point time and again. Just look at how much damage we have to repair from the hurricane events that we have in the Caribbean every year. Every year, mind you. I grew up in the Caribbean. We did not, okay, I'm dating myself, but in the past we didn't have it every year. It was frequent and it was regular, but it wasn't every year. Now it's every year. And this is the sort of thing that we can point to. Now, when we when we looked at some of the other things that were said, um, I mean, you, you raised the, the question of, of digitalization, and, and I think that's one of the major challenges that countries are facing. We've seen, for example, that um, many countries, although they would have liked to go online, they would have had the opportunity to go online if they had had the infrastructure and the access. But they didn't. And that is a tremendous source of, of deepening inequality and of countries being left behind. Let there be no doubt about it. I mean, the, the digital divide, if you're on the wrong side of it, there's no way in hell that you're going to be able to keep up with everybody else. Right? But there are lots of ways in which we can see innovation happen, especially in the digital space, just as long as governments are in, in some way accommodative. And I mean, you, you, you mentioned the, the fintech, the, the financial technology, and in the continent of Africa, there's been a tremendous amount of innovation using digital technologies in the financial sector, allowing people to get access to financial services that weren't possible before. Hmm? It hasn't required tremendous amounts of money. It hasn't required hmm. a revolution in government policy, but it has required some form of enabling regulation. And then the private sector can come in and do a lot of what is needed to get a market up and running. But that is something that governments also have to think about. How will people access that digital infrastructure that the private sector will build if there is a market out there? Because these smartphones are very expensive and um, even the refurbished ones are a real challenge for the average household in a, a low income country. And secondly, how can um, governments and society ensure that digital literacy is there, that this digital skills are among the people. And that means education, means bringing that digital world into primary schools. It's a challenge, it's a huge challenge. We think that um, this is something that can be done and governments need to make that a part of their debate with their with their external partners. You know, you want to support us, this is something that you can invest in and that's investing in our future. So those are things that we have to keep in mind. Um, I think that we also had a, an interesting little discussion, um, or at least the the um, presentation from Manop and, and also from, from Lorenzo that showed that you can have massive stimulus packages, but they may not be uh, oriented towards the future because they may be excluding, uh, in the case of Thailand, the environment, and they may not, may not be heading towards low carbon, as in the case of, of Serbia. I think there the argument that we have to bring up is that taking into account the environment, taking into account the low carbon future that we need, isn't going to cost the recovery. There's still that very, very deeply held belief that investing in the environment, investing in sustainability is somehow a cost. And once we start, and the way to chip away at that is to say that, look, if you want to build a coal-fired power plant, you're making a leap of faith. You're, you're taking money, you're investing it in the hope that you will be able to generate electricity in a sustainable way for 30 years into the future. Okay, you, you do that as a, an anticipation of what is to come. Well, why don't we do that kind of anticipation in the right green, sustainable, resilient direction? Right? You're going to be investing anyway. You're going to be taking a leap of faith Anyway, leap towards the solar, leap towards the wind. Why leap into the dirty, nasty old coal? You see, that's the question you have to put. Where is it written that sustainable behavior is more expensive than non-sustainable than, than non -sustainable behavior? It's written nowhere. It's just an article of faith because people have been brought up thinking that way. And that's what we have to keep pushing against. It's actually the inverse because we see it every day 
if we don't take care of what needs to be taken care of, we end up paying more. If we don't protect the environment, we end up losing it or it kills us. <laughs> there isn't really a, a third path. Yeah, the, the, these are the arguments that we have to put to people and the, the, the un and immutable, the, un, the inevitable and immutable truth is the longer you wait to make the adjustment, the more expensive it will be, but you will adjust one way or another. Right? Do it now while you can control the process. Don't wait until it falls on your head. And I think that, that is something that we really have to push much, much more. And then the last thing, uh, Lorenzo, you pointed out that you're not clear that the donors are on board, that even some of our projects from the UN system are fully uh, consistent with sustainability. And that is a very distinct possibility. And that's why I said at the very beginning, the first of the three things that I think we have to do to secure the recovery is to make sure of the SDG alignment. Right? We should really ask ourselves, any decision we make, is it consistent with the SDGs or is it, is it not? Right? And ask ourselves that honestly, and we'll find that there are a lot of things that we do just because we've always done them that really aren't sustainable right? or that have a, a, a sort of a, a tinge of the gray of the brown. You know? And, and we should be talking about those, looking at them seriously, because there's usually some way of taking away that unsustainable element or reducing it. We need to be thinking about it, though, to identify where the scope is. And then um, finally, when I, I do have to come back again to the question of finance, and I think that we have um, a real opportunity. Stephen, you mentioned the, the G20 is reinvigorating or resuscitating the sustainable finance, and they want to elevate it now to a working group so that we actually have the possibility mm. of coming up with decisions to be taken. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes into finance that we don't tend to pay a lot of attention to. But with a little bit of political will and a lot of um, push, we may be able to make some progress now. One of them is digital uh, taxation. Uh, economies are going digital. They, they have been for a while. But that means more and more of the value added is done in digital ways, and we have to find a way to to deal with that. And so we need to put pressure in the global fora, including in the UN, that this is something we as countries, we as citizens of the world you know, want and need and drive that because it's 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 a tremendous possible gain on the revenue side, but a tremendous possible loss if we don't. And I think the second thing is we, we really have to start thinking about how we can mobilize the domestic financial sectors. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of talk about mobilizing the private sector. Deep in the back of our minds, we're talking about somebody else's money from outside. That's what we're thinking about. Some some rich investor from Wall Street or from Frankfurt is going to descend with a whole bag full of money to invest in our countries. And yet we don't think about how we could mobilize the financial surplus that exists in our countries. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is sitting there being underutilized. Some of it is going abroad to be invested at reasonably weak returns. Why don't we try to figure out what we can do in the borders to get that domestic money to be used more effectively? I think there might be scope there to do quite a bit. Stephen, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to stop there. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to listen to, to our colleagues from the ground. As you can see, yeah, we all of us face challenges somewhat different. Um, good luck in Serbia, then, Lorenzo. <laughs> but uh, it's important for us to share these experiences, I think, because it, it, it educates and improves us all. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Elliot. Thank you for your time uh, this morning and this afternoon for some of us. It's been a really great discussion, and it leads me to think that there may be value in future discussions of this nature. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I, I understand from Assad there are two things that are worth mentioning here going forward. One is that um, PAGE will continue to be active in many of the countries in which you operate. And so to the extent that there are future programming, there's green recovery activities under play, let's, let's stay in touch. Um, and obviously, uh, Elliot will look to you as well for advice from the, mm -hmm. from the center of the UN on that. The other thing I was going to mention, and Elliot, I'm sure this is on your radar screen, there's a DCO meeting, I understand, at the end of March on green recoveries being led by UNDP and by UNEP and FAO mm -hmm. possibly. Yeah. Another chance to, to bring these issues to the table from what we're hearing from the field. So colleagues, I would definitely encourage you to feed into that, whether it's via Elliot or via your resident coordinators, and certainly from UNEP side, I'll be involved with Tim Caston. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a great chance for us to bring our voice on green recovery into the UN. Yes. 
So thanks very much, Elliot. Thanks, colleagues, for joining. Thank you, thanks, Asad, for convening us, and have a Thank great you. rest of the day. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.